Good morning, fellow data enthusiast, um, and evening from from my friends in Australia, which one of them has joined at least, and the other one is uh, is on his way. So uh, I'm not entirely alone here in the dark. Uh, it's not too bad. It's only it's only 7 p.m., so uh, I shouldn't be complaining, and I'm I'm not. Um, I really look forward to today. It's going to be about what else? Code generation and automation for data solution. My favorite topics and. I'm going to cover something today that I think is really cool and interesting. And it's something that brings all kinds of data warehousing concepts together into something that I refer to as this engine for, for data automation. But before we go there, I'd like to share a couple of personal views on what it means to work with data and why I think that the, the patterns and the things and the technologies I'm going to show today are worth considering. Because for me, Data is, is typically and mostly just, just stuff, right? It can be, it's whatever. And I define data as evidence of events, of activities by something or someone that has persisted somewhere and that we can uncover and analyze if we want to do that. And to me, that, that process of uncovering and analyzing something that happened in the past is similar to how I you know, imagine paleontologists digging up these ancient fossils and skeletons and use these bones and these artifacts and fossils to piece together what actually happened at that forgotten moment in time. And as a kid, it was one of those, those, those things I really got into, like uh, fossil searching, dinosaurs, all kinds of things, like, like any young boy, I suppose. But the idea of, of, of that thing that happened in the past and it just sticks there until we decide to cover it, to, to, to dig it up and to figure out what it means. It really stuck with me. And it's also similar to how biologists use that same fossil record to improve the understanding of you know, what, what, why we came to be the way we are, right? How evolution unfolded. So what we see here now is a set of visualizations of the, the tree of life, right? This visual that talks about the relationship between living things and the closeness as, as species together on their shared characteristics, their, their uh, genetic materials. And I find that a really good analogy for what it means to work with data. Because our model, our interpretation of reality, it's only as good as the understanding that we have at a point in time. And when new things, new facts, new events, new knowledge or understanding comes up, becomes available, then these views and this model, it should change. And scientists like these biologists and paleontologists, they, 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 they know that, right? They know that new evidence may mean that what we previously, previously thought to be a truth might have to be adjusted. And I think that's, I think that's awesome. I think that's, that's really fascinating. And these, these, these models that we see on the screen here, these visualizations, they have changed dramatically over the years when new discoveries are made. So by following this scientific method, we collect and collect more context that supports our understanding of what is definite, at least to the point that we know that now, and what is still being clarified. We're just things we're not too sure about yet. We're working on assumptions. And to me, working with data is similar because we, we find ways to, to extract these, this data, these events that happened somewhere and interpret it and collect it and do something with it. And this data is what we get it from. We typically talk about source systems or feeding systems or, or things like that, operational systems. And these are the applications that support the day-to-day -day operation of the business. And as we all know, there are many, and they are very varied. They come in all kinds of shapes and sizes and colors, designs, levels of quality, processes around it, controls, consistency, reliability, and of course, technology. So it's like all over the place in every new, co new company you go in, there's this patchwork of applications that may or may not talk to each other in the same language and, and things like that. All of them create data. All of them do things because people run their day-to-day -day business on it. Because data is created when people follow these business processes using these applications. For example, entering new customers and systems and processing refunds and stuff like that. So by understanding those processes, we, we get this better view about what the data means. And 
this context that we get is important, critical even, to actually understanding what the data means, how to use it. And it's something that you, you just don't get right from the start. It's something you have to fine tune over a longer period of time. And that is something that is really hard to get right. And I would say it's almost impossible in most cases. It might be pretty straightforward for some data points, but this context may also be completely non-existent, right? It may not be there. The people that actually understand what's happening may not be there. It wasn't documented. People were using workarounds, not following the normal documentation. The system has some shortcuts. Uh, the processes have changed. So we look at the current state of the processes, but in the past things were doing differently. And we just look at the data that was generated back then from today's understanding of how the process works. Stuff like that. So there's so many reasons why it's not always super clear what this data really means. And this understanding, this context, and I keep using the word context because it's, it's, it's what shapes the, the model at the end. We use that to define that model. And you often hear, hear about the single version of the truth, for example, or have lots of workshops and piece together this, you know, this holistic business model about this is what the business does, this is how it quote unquote should work. And you know, depending on, on how you look at, at implementing that, you take different avenues to work towards that ideal goal. So at, the, at best, you work with an imperfect understanding of the data. You work with an, a model that is, you know, needs to under, undergo a couple of revisions at the very least. And that's, that's not even it yet, because the business itself changes as well. You've got new products, you've got merges and acquisitions, you've got technology being, uh, being changed, business models being changed, and all of that impacts your model, right? Your interpretation of the world. And last but not least, to make matters even worse, the methodology and techniques that we use change too. I think that even today, we, we haven't truly figured out all the necessary details for something like DataVault, right? We're here in the DataVault user group. New ideas and new patterns and new ways of doing things keep coming up, right? And having worked with DataVault for more than 20 years now, I, I certainly have let go of some ideas of how to do quote unquote data fault and picked up some ideas from others. And that's, I think that's great, that's progress, but it obviously does mean that things change as well. And I've, I've got this opinion and I was at the, um, the data fault, uh, the, the Elm forum in, uh, what was it, November in, in Rotterdam, where I sort of talked about a little bit, it, I, I think that when at the point in time when you were exposed to data vault is it, it sort of colors your understanding of what it means to work with it right so to do data vault is very different from back in the early 2000s to 2010 to to now these methodologies they change over time and when certain things just work better we should find a way to incorporate it right and and that's also one of the drivers to 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 you know, make sure that designing for change is important. And one of the core beliefs for me to, to build these solutions to begin with. So it's okay to change your mind. You have to account for degree of flexibility. And the, the, the way I look at it is that, yes, we want this single version of truth, this business model. We know that everything around us changes, right? Technology, company, uh, understanding of data, methodology itself, everything is, is fluid. So we have to approach this ideal as close as we can. And it's, it's a moving goalpost. It changes all the time. But thanks to automation, you can get really close to it, or at least as close as possible, and, and try to keep up with this ever-shifting state. Right? It's, it's, a, it's, it's a morphing organism. So imagine you build this model, everybody's super happy with it, and then you throw it all away, you truncate it, and your model just grows back automatically. 
and then you truncate it again, and then it sort of grows back automatically exactly the same way. And then you change it a little bit, and then it grows back into that shape. And then you go back to the previous version, and it comes back the exact same way. How cool would that be, right? So that's what we're going to do today. So um, I'm Willem Vos, and I refer to myself as an automation enthusiast because I, I really like working with that, right? Making, making things run automatically, generating code, DevOps, all that kind of stuff. And I, I, for a long time, I've been referring to it as inspired laziness because it's really, you know, it's really hard work to be professionally lazy. So, you know, it's a, it, lazy is good. And I'm going to spare you from this, this lengthy sort of history of, uh, of, of Hooland. Um, suffice it to say, there's a couple of things that I think are, are meaningful to share in this context. Um, the most important one is that the code that I'm generating and running today, you can actually try yourself, try for yourself at home. And that's this Agnostic Data Labs uh, link here, you know, agnosticdatalabs.com, beta.agnosticdatalabs.com. So Agnostic Data Labs is this, uh, this venture that me and, and Stefan Jonsen is also on the call. Um, we started a couple months back uh, as a new platform for data automation. And we think we approach the space from, from an angle that is unique. And it, you know, it's still early days and we're still working on it. But if you go to this beta link, and it's coming back at the end of the deck as well. But if you follow that, you can register. And then we can set you up and you can run this and, and other code as well. We're still tidying things up before we're really done, before we can say, yep, it's a general available version. That's why it's still beta. But the things I'm covering today work fine as they do. So by all means, uh, give it a go if you think this is of interest and you want to know a bit more. Obviously, 40, 45 minutes is not a lot of time to go into all the details of everything. But you know, it, if you can run it yourself, you, uh, you might get an idea. And of course, reach out if, if not, which we'll get to later. So that's Agnostic Data Labs. And then the GitHub link is there because the ideas and concepts and some of the technologies that we use for Agnostic Data Labs are open source. There is this whole collection of frameworks that you need in place to run this stuff. And that's what the Agnostic Data Labs platform and other platforms are, are built on. So the idea is that all these open source components keep being expanded, keep being worked on, and Agnostic Data Labs is just one of the front ends for uh, using those concepts. But there are other tools as well, including open source tools. And it's really meant to be that. It's really meant to be available and, and open. So, oops, sorry, this is not the one I wanted to click. Um, we've got this book coming up, which is called um, Data Engine Thinking. And that's really the, the, the underpinnings of the, the, the theoretical underpinnings of all the, these things. It's something I'm working on with Dirk Lerner, a fellow uh, countryman here for you Germans. Uh, you probably know him or some of you know him. We want to wrap that up by a couple of weeks should be available this year somewhere. And it's, yeah, it's really, really, really something I'm super proud of. And I, I really hope you'll have a look when it's, uh, when it's done. And it explains pretty much the background of what I'm talking about today as well. And last but not least, there's the, the web blog with some of these practical tips and the, the link to the training materials for coaching and trainings if you're interested in those kinds of things. Right. With all that out of the way, a uh, lengthy introduction, but let's uh, let's get into it. So I've, I've still got like 35 minutes uh, roughly to talk. So, you know, five to 10 minutes for questions, as uh, Christian said. If you do have questions in the meantime, feel free to put them in the chat because uh, Stefan is there as well, and he might be able to, uh, well, he not might me, he will definitely be able to answer some of that. So we might even get a, couple, a bit of time back if we're lucky. Am I right? So the engine, I'll keep this pretty short because uh, the, some people, this is familiar to some of the people in the group and I, I am aware of that and I, I don't want to dive into too much detail, but this is important context because 
to make all these things work that we're going to see, you need a lot of stuff to have in place. And each of these blocks that we're going to use to build this engine is a framework in itself, which is also on this open source GitHub. So what do we need? We need something to capture metadata in. The schema for, for, data, for data warehouse automation, right? Or something like that, like a repository where we store our design. Foundational. We need something to keep the original role events that have happened prior to any interpretation at all, which also means prior to going into the data vault. That's the persistent staging, right? Just the transaction log of all the changes that, that are happening timestamps. We need to understand exactly what, in, in detail, what it is we're trying to do, right? I'm such a fan of having a library of patterns that say, a hub works like this, a satellite works like this, we're gonna do date math like this, we're gonna make these and these decisions, and based on these and these considerations. Because then you can start to talk about code generation and templates. So templates are the implementation of that pattern. Like, how do I do this best in that particular technology? And how can I automate that using the metadata that I have? You need a way to reload history deterministically. Spoke introduction about letting things, something grow, pruning it, letting it grow again. You can only do that if your processes are truly deterministic. We need to be able to version it because we need to go from this model to the earlier model back to the current model and maybe have two models with different versions at the same time. So we need a way to version everything, which means we need to version the data, which is the PSA. We need to version the metadata, which is happening in typical repositories. We need to version the templates, which is also part of the same repository. As long as we version that in the same context, we can do anything. We need a way to apply some automation pipeline of sorts to do this automatically. So when there is a change, it can be triggered by a commit in the version control, could be triggered by a change in the model, but then the updated design needs to be refactored automatically. Again, all the things you need to have in place to make the stuff that I'm gonna demo today work. And please go to the GitHub and have a look. We need a, a way to implement checks and balances and validation to make sure that the data we generate still conforms to the intent or the purpose that we, uh, we intended for it. So it's a, a, a testing and data validation framework. So it's testing as regression, but it's also checking periodically if things are still okay. I use that in this demo for reference to therapy. I'm not sure if I'm getting to it, but I can run it if we, uh, if we need it. And we need some way of running things and understanding when we run it, what has happened, why, by whom, and what the outcome was. Very important to maintain the integrity of the overall application. We need to be, be reminded and be notified if something is out of the ordinary. And then we can take a step back and look at all these things and say, is it really that meaningful to keep talking about, you know, do we need a link satellite or should it be a hub and satellite? Should, how do we do dragon keys? How do we do transactional links versus historized links versus modeling things out? All these kinds of things they are. At, the, at some point you zoom out to a certain level of abstraction that it doesn't matter as much. And we can really talk about, oh yeah, we still have the same model, but if we link it to design pattern that does a link like this, then you know your physical model will look like, look like will start to look slightly different. So having that ability to connect your design to logical conceptual models is really meaningful. Of course, we need transformations in there. I'm not going to dive into that too much. And then the, the you know, the what's it? The, <laughs> uh, I know that this is one of those rare occasions when I actually know the Dutch word, but not the English word. It doesn't happen as much anymore. But the thing that, that locks it all to, in place is the, um, is, is the optimizer that, that figures out how the, uh, the ideal model can be, the ideal physical model can be generated from the logical model based on the, you know, the, the um, directives that we provide. And I, I, I love that, right? So that's, that's the engine. That's the stuff that's built into these frameworks and that is then running in, in the background doing what it needs to do while we figure out how the model is going to, uh, to change. 
we can start collecting runtime information, query patterns, usage, and stuff like that. And then we can start talking about the, the, the really the, the semantic meaning of, of the things that we're working off, the, the glossaries, the, the, the taxonomies. And we do that by doing workshops. So my ideal is that we spend all our time in workshops and we tweak the metadata and everything just merges and, and refactors automatically. That's, that's what I think is awesome. And that's when we're winning. So the engine gives you the power to do that, right? It's what drives the wheels. The direction of where we're going is driven by workshops and, and governance processes. And we can adjust a little bit where we are on the road by the information we collect from using the system. That's, that's the engine. I've got an example running on a local SQL server that I'm going to switch over in a bit, but I, I do want to explain a little bit what this solution, solution looks like first before we go into uh, the, the, the screenshots. So um, this solution, and I, I use the term data solution over data warehouse more often than not, but it's a pretty standard three-tiered design. So you've got data that is loaded from the operational system into a persistent staging area, a PSA, going to an integration layer, which this is like the equivalent of a raw data vault, if you, if you will, a distant data vault, if you will. But data goes into the persistent staging, and then from there it goes into this integration area, and from, here it, from there it can either go into the delivery or get some transformations and then go into there. So if you see terms like derived and base and stuff like that. You'll see different tables being created that, that, that have those uh, monikers. So keep, keep that in mind. It's typical three, um, three layer stuff. So not super exciting, but what is exciting and what I'm really passionate about is that this bit here is the only thing that's truly persistent, physical. And it's really only the persistent staging area. So I'm, I'm a really big fan of capturing everything first and then drawing any interpretation, including modeling later. And this is where the term virtual data warehousing comes from that I sometimes use because all this stuff can be changed whenever. So virtual means you can, you can morph these layers into whatever you need it to be. And you know you can deploy these views for sure, right? So often, if you hear virtual data warehouse, like, oh, that's layers of views, and that 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 could be true, but it could also be procedures, stored procedures that load tables over and over again, and as long as you truncate them, then they just grow back. But whatever you're doing, you're always using the same steps, same architecture, and you'll get the same outcome. So the technology in that, ex or, or the, the the implementation choices of actually delivering that, sort of less less interested in. But you know, to uh, avoid some of the criticism I sometimes uh, get by using views, because we can't always, um, you know, go into production with views on on big data warehouses, and I and I get that. Although I still feel it's super cool if we actually could do that uh, conceptually. But you know, I don't care. We can also generate the desktop procedures, which I will be doing today. And these stored procedures. They are generated in a way that they are completely independent of each other. So all these procedures, they basically have to load from the PSA, right? Because that's the only place where you actually have a copy of the data as it was. So how does that work? That's done by using load windows. So each procedure loads data from the PSA to their hub link satellite, whatever. And from the Hublink satellite into the dimensions and the software will see that. But each PSA to integration layer procedure has its own load window. So each time you run that, it processes whatever there is to do. And how does, how does, how does that kick off? Each of these procedures is kicked off in a state machine. And a state machine in this sense is an, is an internally running process like a service or daemon or something like that where you have a, a number of slots available. And every time a slot opens up because one of the processes has changed, then you know, the, the, the next process from the queue will be picked up based on its priority 
and then execute it. And then when it's completed or something else completes, another thing pops up. So there is no dependency. There is no orchestration. It just loads whatever there is to load in whatever priority you set it. Another of those concepts I really, really love. So I'm, I'm really can't wait to uh, boot up the server and show you, which will be a couple of minutes away. But it's such a cool way to do this because you can tweak this prioritization to fix a whole bunch of problems like, like race conditions and bottlenecks, delays, and, and everything. It's super transparent. It's a uh, yeah, big, big fan. So the state machine runs on my local server. And in fact, I've got two because you've got one of these state machines that loads data into the PSA continuously. And you've got other state machine that loads from the integration layer into, sorry, from the PSA into the integration layer. At the, at the same time. So there is no order, there is no dependency. It just loads and at some point it's back to where it needs to be. And then for, uh, because I ran out of time preparing this demo, I just said, look, let's do the views on the top. Obviously I can do the same there and I have done that in, in other projects. But the, the, the presentation layer, the dimensional model in this case, is just a, a layer of views. So that's, uh, that's that. Um, last but not least, I have created this demo in SQL Server because it's easy for me, right? I can just take it with me on the road and I can tweak on it when I'm in the plane or waiting somewhere in the, I don't know, like family shopping or whatever. So we have some demos in other technologies as well. So you can also look at stuff like this in Snowflake, for example. It doesn't really matter that much. It's just a, just a tweak of the code generation template in the end. So let's uh, let's start running things. So I'll switch back to my local SQL server. And what we have done here is I've got these databases here that say staging area, persistent staging area, integration layer, prestation layer, and, and they're empty. So the first thing I'll do is to, to generate the demo and, and kick it off. And to do that, I have prepared some code and I'll show you how I got there in a bit. But basically, I have generated a set of scripts and this is the stuff you can do yourself as well, right? And if I, this is from my earlier project work. So if you run this deployment script, which is a PowerShell script that is, is generated as part of the whole uh, automation, and of course you can put it in DevOps, but I run it manually here, then it will start setting up the implementation of the whole solution as it is defined in metadata now. So now if I go back and have a look, there should be some tables, there should be some tables, and I can start running to see what happens. And you can already see in my integration layers, in my data vault, I've got like three rows here and everything else is empty. And if I keep running, now there's five rows, and then I need to wait because the PSA also needs to be populated. But slowly but and surely, slowly but surely, you see that more and more data comes in. So this is this is that state machine running, right? It will say, I've got so many slots, I'm going to pick up the one that's next. And if I want to see what order that is, I can have a look at the the list that is giving telling the state machine which process to pick up next. So this is an example, right? So it says, let's do this link first, then do this other link, then do this link, then this else set. And it's just based on nothing in particular because it's all um, in. It, it's all started from scratch, right? The load window is not there yet. So the first time it runs, it will say, what can I do? And I can load data from the beginning of time based on the, the description timestamp, right? The, the, the load date timestamp in data vault. When did I get the data? Up until where I can load it. And that's how you can build those load windows. So this, this will keep changing and changing. And you can see that now this is at the top and then now it's gone. And now this one will be gone. In the meantime, my data warehouse is done. So now I've got this data warehouse loaded. And I, I can create some random dimension that I've generated as, a, as an example. It doesn't really matter. What matters is that if I drop the whole thing. So now I'm going to truncate everything, including the load window. Then everything is gone, but it starts to pop up and then it will keep rerunning and reloading until it's back 
in its original state. So when I leave this running, it will it will come back and look exactly the same. So let's have a look what we uh, how we how we got there. And this is where we can go to um, Agnostic Data Labs. So the code that I'm running from the Visual Studio Code screen that I showed earlier is generated from the tool. And this is the stuff that you can do at home. So this is our uh, our new new platform. And you know this is not a this is not a software demo. It's not meant to be a software demo. We um, I just want to show how how you can do this yourself. Um, it's basically going to this get started guide, and it will say. Sure, right? You've got stuff that you uh, that explains how it works. You can specify where you want your metadata to be saved in your repository. And then you then this is the critical part. You can connect to a folder that you can create. When you do that, the browser will say, "Can I interface with your metadata?" And it's it's local metadata or or Git metadata because we're really of the opinion that we want to have a way that um, we can version control things separately from the tool and run things separately from the tool. And that's it. So now the tool can connect to your local drive that you've nominated. And then you can select this uh, data, data false physical data warehouse SQL Server preview, which is the demo I'm going to show today. I'm not going to press next here because it will deploy all the objects and then I need to generate all the objects to, to demo it. So instead, what I'll do is I'll, I'll disconnect from here, open up the one that I've prepared earlier. And it will again say, do it, am I OK as a browser to access those files? And it will show me the design. And the design is a list of, let's go to the graph. I'll show you a little bit later. but. Basically, you know, stuff like hubs, links, satellites, right? Now, that's all okay. I think it's good to take a quick step back and look at the model itself, because I am super happy that there's so much data in it, and it's always the same. But if I look at the model, and I'm going to drag that model in, and I've, I've, I've created in SQL DBM for now, it's a model, right? We don't really care about it too much. There's their customer, there's an offer, there's a membership. But when I look at it, I'm like, you know, this hub customer going through this linked membership with this LSAT and this membership plan, it has this, this oddity here, this uh, degenerate field, degenerate attribute. It has linked satellites that I'm not super big fan of these days anymore. Um, I want to change that, right? I want to ultimately go and model this out into its own business concept. I want to model the membership out as its own business concept as well, as opposed to having a link now. So I need to create a new hub for this one. I need to create a new satellite for this one. I need to update the link, probably rename the link as well, and then model and take this one out and model it somewhere else. So. A, a big change in the model because you know I've fallen from my beliefs from the early days and I've adopted some other beliefs. And as we said, if you the more you abstract, the less it matters. But at this point, it matters to me, and I want to change this model. So what we need to do is to basically do something like this. We go from oops, this is not the screen I wanted to to go to. We go from this one where we have a hub to another hub for the, the plan and this link satellite and this degenerate uh, column here to something like this. Because I think that's better. And we don't need to agree on that, right? But it, what we'll see is if I do this and I don't like it, I can go back to my early state and it's still, it's still OK. So model this out, change this link, create this hub, and create a satellite. Now, what we're going to do then in uh, Agnostic Data Labs is stuff like this. We can go here and move it around, right? And uh, where where is my membership? This would be, oops, apologies. Where is it? This would be something else. I want to call it a subscription. Oops, subscription membership, for example. 
And look, I'm not gonna make these changes here because it's pretty boring and I have prepared it earlier. But what I think is important is that all these things, these objects, they are defined in here. So I've got this, this customer that has columns and stuff like that. And more importantly, I know which mappings are attached to this and where it's going as part of the lineage, which is sort of built into the metadata anyway. So by using this, this open source schema, we, we get this, all, this stuff all for free. So I can see all these objects, they map to this, what we call a data object, a table, top customer. And what, what happens there, if I make these changes in the model, these objects will change, these mappings will change. Ultimately, then I'll, I'll go to the, that's, this is not what I wanted to show. Um, we'll, we've connected the mappings, and I need to go back and select it here, to templates. So we know that this object is subject to this template. And these templates is where the code generation happens. So in the templates, we have these ones, and this is the one that I have looking at looking at earlier, and this is what actually generates the code. So by connecting this to the object, I can generate this code. As you will recognize, some of you will, this is the exact same way as we've been doing this for years and years in, in Team VDW and the open source automation frameworks. It's just a nicer uh, front end around it. So that kind of stuff goes into the preview, and that will give me ultimately my stored procedure. So to explain how that works, and again, not meant to be tool demo because you can do this at home, but the template generates this code. And when I press play in the code generator, it will create the code for all those mappings and the deployment scripts and the documentation and the testing scripts and all the other stuff that we'll find in, um, in the tool. So that's what will ultimately happen when I run, when I press generate, it will then in this output update the stuff that I can then version control or put into a DevOps framework. So we've got a new deployment script. I've got a new um, a set of tables, including uh, the subscription membership, the, the hub channel, the degenerate field that's gone, and stuff like that. So now, uh, before I go, and I keep forgetting this, before I go, let's stop the queue, the state machine which is this one, I've got two, this one and this one. So now these automatic processes that load everything, they stop working, so my data warehouse doesn't grow back. But if I go here and get rid of all these tables, obviously there's not much left. And now if I, we see if in the in the right one, yeah. If I deploy this version, let's go to the right direct. Ah, let's go to the right directory, and now it will deploy the updated version, and the queue will start, and everything will be uh, will be fine. So now I've got my my updated model, which will tell me, which will grow back in time, for that, and I think that I think that's that that's awesome. This obviously can only be done because you've got the PSA. Uh, up and running. Let's give it a minute. I think you'll believe me that if I truncate the table again, it will keep coming up. But slowly but surely, this updated model of my uh, you know, of my data will come into existence and will be uh, will be populated. Again, this can only work if all those frameworks align to make this uh, to for for this purpose. But I think it's, again, such a cool way of doing things. If you want to go back to the previous version, all I need to do is stop the queue, delete out my integration layer or whatever, and then deploy the other version, and then I'm back to where I was. So I wanted to sort of stop there uh, and have a bit of time for questions and, and things like that, because we, Create some real estate here because it's. I know it's 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 a lot, right? And I I don't want to bore you with too many too many details on on how it works. But I definitely invite you to reach out and 
talk to me about it, right? And to work with me on these open source frameworks and to use these tools, which are free, right? And I really like these kinds of topics. So if nothing else, it'd be my pleasure to be able to, to show this to you. Um, obviously, my contact details are on the deck. So do reach out if you want to know more. What we've done is we've thought about why is designing for change so important? And we've looked in detail into one of the ways to make that happen by having the right combination of frameworks and patterns and automation in place to, to give us that. And I think we need it because everything does change. And we've set up our solution in such a way, in such a way that we can change our model, our interpretation of reality in a way that's version controlled and automated. So every time we make a change, depending on how we set up our DevOps, it will then kick off. If we commit this change to Git, we can set it up that it kicks off exactly the workload that is showed today, and it will rebuild the model. We need to have a PSA. But with, by using a PSA, we can have this deterministic set of patterns that actually guarantees that if you load the same data, which is immutable, of course, by definition, if you have that in your code generation, you can be super flexible about how you define what data means and how you run it and load it, the more you understand the context. So again, if you want to try this yourself, go to uh, beta.agnosticdatalabs.com, uh, register, we'll set you up, and you can run it yourself.